Welcome back to session seven. I'm Miss Del Savio with Walt Whitman High School in Bethesda, Maryland, I'm here for my final time with you to talk about AP psychology. So what we're going to do today is to warm up with, of course, so you know by now, if you've been watching these videos, that we're going to go over the FRQ that I presented to you in session six. We had Janice, and she was age eight. And if you hadn't had a chance to read this FRQ and respond to it, I suggest you pause the video now and give yourself time to write it and then come back. And we'll go ahead and go over the three terms and how they apply to Janice. So go ahead and pause, and I'll come back to you. Okay, so here's our sample uh, FRQ response. Um, this is Janice, and of course she's at a birthday party, and we talked about theory of mind. And a child, we say, has developed a theory of mind when they can imagine how somebody else might think or feel. In this case, I applied it to the situation by saying Janice told her mom that her friend lost all of her coins to play games. She said that even though her friend didn't cry, she must have been sad. So in that example, that shows theory of mind. The second one was schema accommodation. This happens when a person adds new information to an existing schema or creates a new one. So for Janice, she went to this birthday party and she modified her schema about birthday gifts to now include gifts to charity instead of just toys. So I've given an example of a schema accommodation there a very specific one related to Janice. And finally, pre-conventional moral reasoning, which is about involving uh, moral reasoning from an egocentric point of view. So basically determining you know, what you're gonna do based upon what reward or punishment you're going to get. In this case, we say that Janice actually obeyed the rules of the entertainment center that were given to her so that she would not get kicked out, okay? Very much a pre-conventional thought process. What are we going to learn today? Okay, we're in my final unit here, and we're going to be looking at motivation, emotion, stress, and personality. So as usual, way too much information to cover in one 50-minute session. So remember, these presentations are here to jog your memory. Please do pause the video when asked so you can go ahead and answer the questions on your own before I go over them. And if you need further instruction on any of these topics, I really would love for you to go to AP Classroom and find a daily video that will help you out. Okay, so theories of motivation. We're going to talk about all different sorts of theories of motivation. Again, if you want to come back to this screen later to see what we cover, it's right here. We're going to start with the instinct motivation theory uh, put forth by William James and McDougall. Uh, in this case, we are motivated by inborn automated behaviors, just like instinctual behaviors. And of course, this only explains a few behaviors. It explains maybe curiosity and maternal instinct and laughter and comfort and even sex seeking behaviors. And these are all behaviors that, again, much will sound a lot like that evolutionary perspective that Dr. Swope went over in session one. These are behaviors that basically increase our reproductive fitness. And when I say reproductive fitness, I'm talking about our ability to pass on our genes. I mean, that's our priority response according to evolutionary models. We're gonna move on to Clark Hall's drive reduction theory. For the drive reduction theory, this motivation is more about, we're, we're motivated by biological drives like hunger and thirst and our body's desire is to maintain homeostasis. If you recall from our session two, we talked about the hypothalamus as being the motivation center. And it was the motivation to reduce those drives. So drives are basically a motivational state and they're produced by some uncomfortable feeling that we have. Um, not psychological feeling, but biological feeling. Typically, it's because something's been depleted, a resource has been depleted, or we've been deprived of something. So an example is a person might experience withdrawal symptoms from not having their cup of coffee in the morning. So they're motivated to go drink that coffee to return their body to a, to a homeostatic balance. Okay, so anytime we talk about withdrawal symptoms, it could be drive reduction. If you're tired, you, you're motivated to go sleep to return your body to homeostasis. So I'm going to relate this motivational theory of drive reduction, though, I'm going to move it from biological to psychological, because we do have some uncomfortable psychological feelings, or it's called cognitive dissonance. Okay, so when there's a, co a conflict between our thoughts and behaviors, we often experience dissonance. So like you find money on the street and you don't return it, you're going to feel dissonance, you might call it guilt. Right, but we're motivated to reduce that dissonance. And that motivation, if you took that money that you found, you might 
you would be motivated to reduce the dissonance, you might say, well, somebody had a thousand dollars in the wallet, they probably didn't need it anyway, or it's too much trouble. No, I will never find the person who owns this money, so I might as well just keep it. So cognitive consistency theory was looked at by Leon Festinger in a very famous study where he paid people to lie about a task that was very boring. And he paid them to lie about it. And some people got paid a dollar and some people you know, got paid more. So if you got paid so, you know, like a dollar to tell someone that a boring task was not boring and you don't think that you're a liar, you're probably you know, going to have some kind of dissonance. And since you're motivated to reduce that dissonance, you already took that one lousy dollar, right? So now you might think, hmm, maybe that task really wasn't that boring. You know, maybe you change your, your mind, your attitude towards that task. So this was the type of study he did. You may have uh, listened to that in class. Let's move on to the incentive theory. And I covered this a lot with you um, when we were, or I guess we should say we covered it a little bit in the behaviorist section when we talked about learning in session four. So this incentive theory is a theory that says we are motivated in ways that will provide us some kind of a reinforcement, some kind of a desirable consequence. Now those desirable consequences may come from outside like praise um, or avoiding a punishment or monetary rewards, but they could also come from inside of us. We call those intrinsic motivators where we're motivated to do something because it just makes us feel good. There's a sense of self-satisfaction or we're motivated to do things to avoid a negative feeling. Right. So remember, positive reinforcement is the addition of a pleasurable stimulus, and negative reinforcement is the removal or avoidance of an unpleasant stimulus. Both of those can be motivating factors. So if we think about intrinsic versus extrinsic, if a team or if you're playing a sport and you have this like sense that there's going to be a reward at the end, like a trophy, that's extrinsic motivation, right? You're motivated by the promise of an external reward. But if you play simply because it just you love playing the sport, you're motivated by the enjoyment and your interest in that sport, that's going to be intrinsic motivation. We know, though, that people who are intrinsically motivated to do a task can lose that intrinsic motivation, and they can lose it simply by being given an extrinsic reward for that task. Well, if we take a look at this graph, it shows you that relationship between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. Okay, So I did ask you what conclusions can you draw, but I think I, I blew that. I already told you. <laughs> but take a look. Here's intrinsic motivation. So let's say you're intrinsically motivated to cook like I am. I love to bake, bake cookies, right? But then all of a sudden somebody starts to say, oh, your cookies are so awesome. Can I pay you to bake them for me? I'm like, sure. And they're like, okay, I want six dozen cookies a week. Well, I make those cookies and I keep getting extrinsic motivation, right, to make those cookies. I'm going to get money. Now, when my kids say, can you make cookies for me, mom? I'm like, yeah, no, I don't want to make cookies. I don't enjoy it anymore, right? So that extrinsic motivation, that extrinsic reward overtook my intrinsic motivation. That's called the overjustification effect, okay? So again, we define that as when intrinsic motivation decreases following the availability of an extrinsic motivator. Now, motivation, um, according to the humanists, it was really through a hierarchy. And Abraham Maslow identified like a hierarchy of needs, but these were basically like needs for which he believed we were motivated to meet. So according to the this hierarchy, Abraham Maslow said that we have this need to meet our physiological desires, like food, water, breathing, our health. And then once those have been met, those have been met, we are motivated to go on to the second level, which would be safety needs. And then the third level, love and belongingness and esteem and then self-actualization. So this is a motivation hierarchy and it might explain certain motivating behaviors like why we uh, maybe go for a PhD, okay? Maybe that's to increase our esteem. But remember, these, this motivation hierarchy really relies on this idea that um, unless these lower needs are met, you're not going to seek these higher needs. You're not motivated to seek them. And we know that may not always be true. But let's do imagine this. A family after a natural disaster destroys their home. Think about it. Where would they be on this hierarchy? You know, what, what needs are they going to be motivated to meet? And where would schooling fit into that? Are you really going to be worried about sending your kids to school when you're worrying about this lower level need right here, safety? 
Let's also talk about the arousal theory, which may actually explain why some people like seek out like very high uh, risk taking arousal activities. So each person, according to this theory, has like an optimum level of general arousal. Okay, just generally, are you you are comfortable with low levels or higher levels of arousal? And we're not talking about just physiological. There's intellectual arousal, emotional arousal. So if you sp like spent a whole week studying for final exams, and you might be so bored that you're seeking out stimulation. So going to an amusement park might be a great way to end your school year. But let's say that you've spent a whole long weekend with your parents, or they think maybe some of you have already done this, touring five colleges in three states. You've been driving around, you're constantly having to like work hard and interview and, and you know, be with your parents. <laughs> so you're kind of been really aroused and now you want to reduce arousal, right? So we're motivated to engage in a behavior. Maybe it's meditating or going for a run, but whatever it is, you want to reduce the level of arousal that you've had. So according to arousal theory, we're either going to be fine where we are, we're going to be motivated to seek higher levels or seek lower levels, depending upon what's been going on in our lives, but also depending upon our individual need for arousal. Okay. Now, Yerkes Dodson took the arousal theory, and they basically looked at certain tasks that we perform, and they said that moderate levels of arousal equal optimal performance. No matter what task we have, there's like a moderate level that's good. Too little arousal, well, we're not really going to be engaged in the task. We're not going to pay a lot of attention to it. We're not going to perform well. Too much arousal, well, we're going to be really stressed about it, and we know what stress can do to our performance. Okay, so what are some of the considerations for optimum levels of arousal? So what I have here is I have Julia. She's a skilled high jumper. And then we have Julia, who's never been ice skating, even though she high jumps, she's never been ice skating before. If you were to think about it, let's take a look at the task difficulty and how that might, af how that might affect what's an optimum level of arousal. If something's really hard for you, do you want to be really aroused or do you want to be low, have lower levels of arousal? So think about that for a second. And I'm going to tell you right now that according to Yorkies Dodson, one of these levels of arousal would be optimal for Julia, whether it's attempting a high jump, which she's really good at, or skating. And in the case of Yorkies Dodson, curve A is the best level of arousal okay, for somebody who is attempting a new task. Okay, so when we talk about the considerations for optimum level of arousal, we know that task difficulty is a really important consideration. Let's also take a look at motivation that we have for equity. Believe it or not, people are motivated by equity, or at least a perceived sense of equity. We want our inputs, and I'm talking here primarily, at, let's say, at work, okay? But we're taking our inputs, like the time we put into work, the effort we put into work, the loyalty we have towards our employer, personal sacrifice, and then we look at our outputs, the pay we get, bonuses, any kind of recognition we get how loyal they are to us, the flexibility an employer has towards us, the esteem and praise we feel. We want the inputs and outputs to be roughly equal. But now let's just say we compare ourselves to others, and we, which, which of course we do. <laughs> we say, do they put more in than I do and get less? Well, if that's true, I better work harder because I'm getting a lot more for what, you know, compared to them. Or do they put in the same? Does that friend that I work with put in about the same amount of work that I do, the same amount of loyalty, but they get paid more, they get more praise? Well, if that's the case, I'm going to restore equity by slacking off. So according to equity theories, uh, equity motivation theories, we're going to compare ourselves to others and we're going to want our inputs and outputs to be roughly the same for us as they are for other people. You know, if the balance does shift, we become demotivated, right? And so we either decrease our input or we just seek a change, like get a new job. Another theory about motivation is the expectancy value theory. And according to the expectancy value, and again, let's take this just using the English language, expectancy value, right? Expectations. We expect that our effort, if we expect, I should say, that our effort will improve our performance. And we expect that our performance, that improved performance will be reinforced, mean, meaning 
will want to do it again. And we value that reinforcement, we're probably going to continue that behavior. We're going to be motivated for that behavior. So let's take a look at this. You have to have all three of these conditions. Santi, is they, are they motivated to put extra hours into work? Let's look. Santi works for a family-owned company where their colleague is the boss's cousin. We know how that's going to go, right? Even though Santi feels capable, Santi suspects that nothing they will do will earn them a promotion. So now let's take a look at the expectancy value theory. There is probably no expectation on Santi's part that their performance will be reinforced. In other words, they're not going to get the promotion, right? And as a result of that, according to the expectancy value theory, what will Santi likely do? And likely Santi will not work very hard, okay? So let's look at those theories of motivation. We know that um, our motivation um, has to do with instinctual behaviors. That just helps us to survive. We know that behaviorist theories, like the pure behaviorists, explain our motivation in terms of extrinsic and, ex and intrinsic rewards. And that cognitive theories of motivation talk about us being motivated to reduce inconsistencies in our head, to achieve equity, and to engage in behaviors that we expect will provide some kind of a valued inducement to us to help us achieve our greatest potential. So these are different theories of motivation. One is very much biological, okay? Um, one is more behavioral, and one is more cognitive. I'm going to practice here. Go ahead and pause. Okay, so this is talking about cognitive dissonance theory. We are motivated to reduce the internal, the psychological tensions that are produced by inconsistent thoughts. The typical example that is often given in textbooks is that somebody smokes even though they know it's bad for them. So you vape and you know it's bad for you, you're going to experience dissonance. And when you experience that dissonance, you're motivated to either, to reduce it by either, you're going to stop vaping, or you're going to say to yourself, ah, I'm only vape a little bit. It's not that bad. It's not going to hurt me. Mm, it will. But, but that's what you might say in order to reduce that dissonance. Okay, go ahead and pause. And this question is asking about drive reduction, drive reduction. So usually when you hear drive reduction, it's a biological drive. In this case, we're talking about somebody who's in has a uh, addiction to heroin would need to inject heroin in order to avoid the withdrawal symptoms. That's a really good example of drive reduction. If I look at the sweet taste of chocolate, that's an extrinsic reward, right? That would be much more of a um, incentive theory of motivation. The enjoyment of a frightening movie might be arousal theory of motivation. Final one, go ahead and pause. Okay, we have Nadula. Nadula tutors other students. Okay, and he does so to be helpful, and Eric does it strictly for pay. This is a clear difference between being intrinsically motivated to do something and extrinsically motivated. And you should now know that if you started to pay Nadula to tutor other students, what would happen to Nadula's intrinsic motivation? It would go down, right? The overjustification effect. So don't pay, don't pay Nadula. Okay. One more practice multiple choice question. Go ahead and pause. Okay, in this case, this is taking a look at the Yerkes Dodson, and we know that optimal performance, remember, it's some moderate level of, of arousal, but we know that moderate level of arousal is a function of two things. Not only is it a function of how difficult the task is, because if it's a difficult task, I need a lower level of arousal. Um, so it's a, a function of both task difficulty and arousal levels. We know performance is impacted by those two things. Okay, moving on to theories of emotion. This is a lot of theories. So again, remember, I'm not trying to teach these to you. We're just going to review them. The very early emotion theories by James Longa said that if there was some kind of a stimulus that produced some kind of a physiological arousal, you'd have an emotion. So let's give an example here. There's an earthquake. Your heart pounds, okay? You feel fear. Stimulus, arousal, emotional experience. Pretty basic. But if I add cognition into the game here, like you actually think about the stimulus, okay? Or in this case, think about the arousal. Why is this happening? 
it could change your emotional experience. And this was Schachter's two-factor, also known as Schachter-Singer theory. So in other words, you have an earthquake, your heart pounds. And according to this theory, the Schachter two-factor theory, you say, have I experienced this before? What happened in the past? What's going to happen now? How are others reacting? (laughs) Obviously, it's a pretty quick appraisal, okay? But you might come to a different conclusion. You may not be um, really anxious. You just might be a little bit nervous because you've been through earthquakes before and nothing really bad ever happened. We're gonna go to another early emotional theory, just like the James Longa theory, the Cannon Bard theory had no cognition in it. It starts off with some kind of a stimulus, okay? And then simultaneously, there's a physiological arousal and an emotional experience. So if I give the example of you hear glass breaking, okay? The physiological arousal when you hear glass breaking might be that your body flinches and that you have an emotional experience of being startled, okay? But that happens simultaneously. You know it's coming next, right? Because we can't just sit here without some kind of cognitive appraisal. So Lazarus took a look at the Cannon Bard theory. They said, okay, there's a stimulus, okay? But there's a cognitive appraisal of that stimulus. Now remember, this is different than Schachter Singer. Schachter Singer said you cognitively appraise the arousal. No, Lazarus says there's a stimulus. And before there's any kind of arousal or, or emotional experience, you're going to appraise that stimulus. So let's go back. We have the glass breaking. Immediately, Lazarus says, you're going to take some cognition into play here. Am I hurt? Is there any danger with this glass breaking? If the answer for both of those is, yeah, no, there's no danger. Well, I'm not going to have any kind of physiological arousal, and there's really not going to be an emotional experience. Okay. So that's why you might be somebody that you hear glass breaking and you don't really think there's any danger with glass breaking. You've had no experience with that before. You just don't think much of it. But if you happen to have had a job as a waiter or a waitress, you may hear glass breaking. You're like, oh my gosh, that's a disaster that has to be cleaned up. And so you will experience something. Okay. We talk about emotion sometimes from the low road and the high road. So I'm going to just go back to Unit two, again, that's session two, where we talked about the amygdala. So Zizia, um, I always pronounce the name wrong, but Ledoux, <laughs> they talked about stimuli, and some stimuli trigger a rapid emotional response. And it's something we don't even have a lot of control over, especially like a loud noise, you know, like especially the sound of a, sh- a gunshot or something. You can like immediately tense up. So there's certain stimuli. You're, you're walking in the, the forest at night, like maybe you're just walking through the forest. I don't know why you'd be walking through it at night, but let's say you are. And then you hear like footsteps behind you. You don't expect it. That might trigger something. Or you're you're sleeping in your bed in the middle of the night and a loud sound occurs. So we have these emotions. There's no conscious appraisal going on or, or non-conscious appraisal going on. No cognitive anything. Immediate reaction. Zayons, that's his name, Zayons and Ledoux. Okay. So that's what we call the low road to emotion. So let's take a look at cross-cultural similarities in emotional expression. You might recall Paul Ekman's studies on facial expressions and how he understood that we have certain six or seven universal, depending on your textbook, facial expressions. We know that expressing emotions um, are pretty similar across cultures. People smile when they're happy, they cry or frown when they're sad, their brow furrows when they're, when they're angry. So we know that sometimes when we look at those that expression of emotions that it can actually cause us to more strongly feel that emotion. So no matter what, what culture you're in, if you cry, it could make you feel even sadder. Okay, if you smile, your, your mood will improve because those facial muscle states trigger corresponding emotional feelings. But here's the thing that, you know, if you are taught not to express anything, it's not, your emotions are going to be maybe a little less intense. And those could be some cross cultural differences. But in terms of certain similarities, we do know that there are certain emotions that are um, universal. What comes, like I, like I said, what might be different is are the display rules. So there are cultural norms and those cultural norms sort of govern what you're supposed to display based upon context. So if we talk about even like in the United States, when we meet people, we typically, although this was before COVID, we shake hands. Maybe now we, we bump fists, okay? We certainly wouldn't 
typically in this culture bow. But there are display rules in other cultures that would show something different. Like in Japan, bowing can be that show of respect. It could be saying goodbye. It could be asking for a favor and each bow is a little bit different. So while cultural, uh, there are cultural similarities in terms of facial expressions, the display rules for other cultural, other expressions of emotions are probably different between cultures. So just to recap, early emotion theories did not account for cognitive appraisal. There are certain stimuli that are kind of evolutionarily programmed to respond too quickly. It's called the low road. Our subjective experience, how we experience the stimulus, how we respond to it, our expressions, our culture, our cognitive appraisal of it, all come together to create the emotion. And again, emotions that are accompanied by a corresponding behavioral response, like smiling or crying, are going to be strengthened. A couple of practice multiple choice, so go ahead and pause and read. Okay, this is the Schachter two-factor theory. We have a racing of the heart and that, that cognitive appraisal of the heart racing of that physiological response is what we talked about with Schachter Singer, okay? So it's consistent with Schachter Singer's theory. There's a stimulus, a physiological arousal, and then we appraise that arousal. In this case, he interprets Lee, his racing heart to be He's eager to, he's anticipating the excitement of being able to give his first opening statement. So go ahead and pause for Kyle. Okay, with Kyle, which of well, the following psychological concepts supports this idea that after smiling for 30 minutes, you know how you have to put that smile on your face, that he actually feels a little bit happier. That's the facial feedback hypothesis. It's a lot like, you know, when we talk about James Longa, you know, you have a physiological response to a stimulus and then the corresponding emotional expression, uh, emotional experience. I smile, I'm happy. I frown, I'm sad. Facial feedback hypothesis. One more, let's pause. Okay, here's Montgomery. Yeah, I can just prepare my resume, arrive late for my interview. It gets rejected, oh, whatever. It's a matter of dumb luck. Uh, Montgomery's judgment of the situation most clearly reflects an external locus of control. And while we did not cover that yet, <laughs> okay, it's a perfect example though of how we cognitively appraise the situation and we might do so based upon our feelings of who controls power, or who has the seat of power in our lives, which is what locus of control is. And so in this case, Montgomery believes it's external. So he interprets the stimulus of being rejected in a way that's beyond his control. Okay, we're moving on to stress, coping and stressor disorders. And we are gonna talk about explanatory styles and how they can impact your stress response. And we're also gonna look at Hans Selye's general adaptation theory. Okay, and here it is. So here's your body's response to stress. Your body's at homeostasis, it's all nice and happy. And then there's some kind of a stressor. I don't know, let's pick one that you all hear. Like you hear you have a deadline that you didn't know about for a college that you wanna to apply to. Alarm reaction, it's an acute short-term intense stress response. Adrenaline is released, cortisol is re released. Those are two hormones. Adrenaline makes your heart race, cortisol will suppress your immune response, preparing your body for that fight or flight. And then you realize, okay, I have like a couple of days to do this. So you get resistance, you know, to it, okay? Uh, and then finally, if you, as you approach the deadline, you might get exhausted. Your body's no longer able to handle the stressor. That's what Hans Selye called the general adaptation syndrome. And this is actually more for long-term stressors, but it can happen in a, in a long-term meeting, maybe a little bit you know, longer than a couple of hours. <laughs> so how we respond to stress is often due to the way we explain something. So it's a lot about appraising the situation that we just talked about. So stress and explanatory styles. When we talk about explanatory styles, it's our tendency to offer similar explanations for different events. You have an explanatory style. So I'm going to go to what the craze is now, right? Wordle, right? Let's say you solve today's Wordle in just two. And for those of you not familiar with Wordle, you get like, you know, a word that you have to solve in six different tries. So let's say you started off with faint and you 
guessed the right word as tangy, like, oh, I'm very excited. So to what do you offer this explanation of your, this brilliant two, uh, two, two solution uh, to the wordle? Uh, it depends. It depends on your explanatory style. If you have an optimistic explanatory style, you can say, yep, yeah, I can usually figure out puzzle games. I'm really good at lots of different games and I rocked today's wordle. That's if you're optimistic. Now, if you're pessimistic, you'd be like, yeah, well, I did it once. I'm not going to do it again. I'm really not good with most word games. And, but the, the reason I got it was because it was an easy word today. That's a pessimistic explanatory style. And when we talk about explanatory styles, you may hear, hear these things about stable versus unstable. Like things are going to stay the same, right? Stable or they're going to change. Global or local. Oh, you know, I can generalize what happened today, you know, to the rest of my life, that's global or local, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily going to be my whole life. Or it could be as a result of saying there's something about me internally versus something that's external. So uh, that's not that important, but I do want to make sure you understand that the way we handle stress and the way that some people handle it better than others is because of having a particular explanatory style. A lot more stress, as you can imagine, with a pessimistic one. Okay, I want to move to motivational conflicts. And again, not going to go through them all. You've seen these before, I hope. But if you remember, there are certain motivational conflicts. For example, what am I going to do tonight? Or which homework am I going to do first? Um, these motivational conflicts might be looked at as um, one is called approach approach. Like you have two really positive, desirable outcomes. I can go to a movie. I can go to dinner. Either one's great. Very little stress. But you could have to undesirable um, outcomes or choices, I might say. You have to do homework, chem or calc. You don't understand chemistry and calculus is really frustrating. We call that an avoidance avoidance conflict and it can cause a moderate amount of stress. So again, explanatory styles can, can contribute to stress, but so can the actual conflict that you've encountered. I want to take, though, another motivational conflict. Those two are pretty easy to understand, but this one, approach avoidance, might not be. In this case, you have a single goal or option. It has a, both a positive and negative outcome. So you could go for a run with your friend, and the positive thing would be that you get companionship out of it. It increases your endorphins. It's good for you. But the negative could be that oh, I have so much work to do. I don't really, I'm tired, and I don't really have time for this. But that's a conflict, and it can cause a lot of stress and quite a bit of stress when you come across an approach avoidance conflict. Then you have a double approach conflict. So it's more like you have two goals and options instead of one, right? The first one was like, go for a run with a friend or not. I know that sounds like two, but it's really just one. <laughs> but in this case, let's talk about buying a car. Which brand of car are you going to buy? You, you could buy a Tesla or a Honda. And each of them have positive and negative attributes to them. Tesla's pretty cool. It's environmentally friendly. But there's not a lot of charging stations where you live available. It's also really expensive upfront costs. And you, so you would not be able to afford to get all the options you want in the car. But you could buy a Honda. Now, Honda is great. It's affordable. You can get all the options you want, leather seats, sort of heated seats, all that good stuff. But gas prices, hmm, have you looked at them recently? They're pretty high. Also, Hondas are boring. I mean, everybody drives a Honda. And let's face it, if you're worried about the environment, there's a pretty high carbon footprint on those cars. This is what we call a double approach avoidance. And it's really the highest stress okay, situation. I want to talk about stress and trauma disorders. So you've heard of acute stress disorder and you've heard, I'm sure, of PTSD. What is the difference between them? Well, the, the main difference between acute stress disorder and PTSD is time. So it is, of course, due to a stressor. There's some initial stressor event. And if 15 days has passed and you have this stressor event and you're feeling like, you know, stressed about it. And of course, we're talking about the DSM stress criteria. It's right here. Um, there's like nine symptoms you have to meet. <laughs> but if you could be diagnosed with acute stress disorder, but if those symptoms persist for more than 30 days, you would be diagnosed with PTSD. So while the symptoms of the two disorders are the same, the difference would be the time that you've had those symptoms. The longer you've had them, if it's been more than 30 days, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. So just to recap, our body goes through a predictable stress response as identified in the general adaptation syndrome. 
cortisol production during stressful events suppresses your immune system. I covered that in session two, but again, anytime we have cortisol production, we're going to not, we're going to get sick if it's constantly being produced. So that's why chronic stress leads to chronic illness or leads to illness, sorry. Motivational conflicts like approach, 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 avoidance, 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 double approach, avoidance can lead to stress of varying degrees. And like I said, long-term exposure and even single exposure to extreme stressors can, man, um, can actually manifest as acute stress disorder, or if they last for longer than 30 days, post-traumatic stress disorder. Let's do a practice, so go ahead and pause here. Okay, so here we go. How is Nada, Nadia explaining this? Well, very pessimistically. She's saying the only reason she got into her top choice college, not because she's a good student, um, it's just because she got a 4 0 because she has like really easy teachers. She doesn't really do well on standardized tests. She got in, but she has a pessimistic explanatory style and she's likely to experience a lot of stress in life. So go ahead and pause this one here. Okay, in this case, you're talking about different conflicts, which is going to create the greatest amount of stress? Well, again, this is um, where you have the double approach avoidance. You know, you have a paid internship in your hometown, but an unpaid summer position in your favorite European city, whatever that might be. But for Avi, it happens to be Vienna. Okay, there's good and bad about both of them. One, you get paid, but you don't, you know, you're kind of staying at home and it's boring. The other is it's unpaid, so you're going to struggle while you're there, but hey, you get to go to a really exciting European city. Okay, personality theories. Oh, we have a, just a bit of time to get through some of the personality theories. Let's move on and talk about those. We'll talk about Freud's personality theory, where he said the personalities constructed with your id, your ego, and your superego. If you recall that it's like your inner devil, it's all those uh, hidden memories, primitive, instinctual, sexual, aggressive urges. And it's driven by the pleasure principle. I want what I want, and I want it now. Just like kids who are given permissive parenting, right? They're, they never learn to use anything but their id. They can get whatever they want. Then you have your superego on the other shoulder. It's your conscience, you know, your moral conscience. It's learned. Then you have your ego and your ego's job is to deal with the reality principle. You can't always get what you want, but sometimes you can, right? It has to mediate between the desires of the id and the superego. And it's a quite of a balancing act for that ego. So we know that the ego sometimes can't give into the id, sometimes doesn't give into the superego. So what happens when the id and the superego are dissatisfied? Well, we have what we call defense mechanisms. Now, there are a lot of defense mechanisms, and although I'm not going to go over all of them, I am going to put them up here on the screen for you, and you probably recognize a lot of these defense mechanisms. Um, the two I, or the four I'm going to go over are the four that are most commonly confused, or at least they are confused with each other. One is projection and one is displacement. With projection, we often feel bad about ourselves. Maybe we, we don't feel smart. You know, maybe we, we feel like we're not very good at athletics. Maybe we're not, we're not feeling like we're making good friends. And then we project on others. Well, you're just not a very friendly person, okay? You're just not very smart. You're just not very coordinated. But really what you're feeling is that you're not those things. And that's called projection. We just put that on somebody else. Then you have displacement, which is very different than projection, but a lot of people get them confused. Displacement is when you take out those negative feelings, that you don't feel smart, you don't feel socially capable, and then you like, you know, yell at your sibling, okay? You don't tell them anything. You don't say, oh, you're not smart. You basically just yell at them, or you, you know, just you yell at your parents, or you slam a door. Well, maybe not slamming a door, but you just aren't, you're just taking it out on the wrong object. Now I'm going to move to suppression and repression, often confused as well. With repression, it's a lot like dissociative disorders where you don't remember something. You just cannot remember it. And suppression is when you try not to think about it. You could, but you try not to. And both of those are defense mechanisms. Both of those try to take out unwanted memories and either in the case of repression, you literally put it into a place where you can't get to it or suppression where you try not to think about it. Okay. So what kind of assessments are used to uncover 
our personalities? Um, well, according to psychoanalytic theorists, you can use dream analysis, projective tests, um, anything that can uncover like the, the unconscious. Remember, unconscious is the big word when we talk about psychoanalytic. Okay, what are some of the projective tests? Remember the Rorschach inkblot tests? Um, tell a tale test, a thematic apperception test where you tell a story about a picture. Everything that you say supposedly is a window into your unconscious and it's going to give you the true nature of the anxiety that's directing like your disordered behavior. When we move into humanist personality theory, in this case, we're talking about your personality is really an uh, essence of your actual self and your ideal self. Like, who do you who do you see yourself as and who do you want to be? And when there's incongruence, like if they're not matched up, we actually don't feel good about who we are. We don't have good self-esteem. And according to Maslow and Rogers, the humanist, we are endowed with self-actualizing tendencies. We want to become self-actualized. That's the top of that pyramid that I showed you earlier in motivation. We want those two to be congruent, okay? If they're not congruent, the way you would treat that is through the kind of what they call person or client-centered therapy. You would have a therapist who would genuinely care about you, would be listening to you and be empathetic with you, with you, and would give you unconditional positive regard so that you could see your true self, your actual self as your ideal self. Okay. You would say like things like you'd hear the therapist say things like you're a good person, even if you're not pleased with your actions. I can understand that. That must have been hard to hear. How does that make you feel? So a lot of this is going to be directed by if you're the client, by you, the client, by understanding and, and getting emotional support from your therapist. I'm going to move on to trait personality theories, which is more of the, the, the version of nature, like you're born with traits. According to trait theories, personality traits are pretty stable. They, they're stable across time and situation. If you're an impatient person, you're going to be an impatient person, no matter if you're seven years old or 70 years old. Traits have pretty good predictive validity when it comes to observable behavior. So we know that we can likely predict how someone's going to behave in a situation if we take a look at their traits. And all trait theorists kind of believe that there's a finite number of traits. You know, there aren't like thousands of different personality traits. There's kind of a, a finite variation, okay? So um, even though there's a finite number of traits, you could have like six or seven comp in combination that somebody else has another six or seven. So in essence, you could say that you're very unique, okay? But in essence, but we really only have maybe, they believe about six to maybe 12 different traits that you can talk about. So I'm going to talk very specifically to Costa McRae's big five. And again, remember, like all trait theorists, Costa McRae thought personality is stable over time and situations. And they identified five different traits that I see often on AP exams. And here they are listed here. Now, again, I'm not going to go over these, but these five traits can be measured by inventories, personality inventories. And what is a personality inventory? It's a survey. It's asking you, you know, if would you agree or disagree? Is this something you like or dislike? And based upon that, you might find that you are open to new experiences or that you're very conscientious, you're responsible, you hold to your commitments, that you enjoy uh, being with others and you're very sociable, that's extroversion. That when asked about your opinion about things, you might give it, but if other people have a different opinion, you're happy to let them accept that and be good with it, you're agreeable. And maybe you might find, hopefully not, that you are always anxious and you are neurotic, they call inflexible. You doubt yourself. You're constantly feeling judged. So these are all measured, though, by personality inventories. And these are the big five personality traits that Costa and McRae identified. Now, social cognitive theories of personality do not believe that you can take a person's traits and say and predict how people are going to behave from one situation to another. In fact, social cognitive theories say that personality will absolutely change across situations. Albert Bandura called this reciprocal determinism. And basically what he said was this, that we have a certain belief in ourselves and our competence, like how competent are we uh, to accomplish a task? Am I good at something? something, right? And it's called efficacy. And that efficacy, how we feel about a particular task is going to change from task to task. I might feel like I'm really good at cooking, but I'm not very good at athletics, right? So I might have high self-efficacy towards trying out a new recipe, low self-efficacy when it comes to learning a dance move. 
Locus of control, which I referred to earlier, which Julian Rotter talked about, was a belief about who holds the power in our life. Is it us, our outcomes in our life determined by what we do, our decisions, our behaviors, or are they determined by others, by luck, by chance? And all of these come together to create how we're going to behave in a situation. There's our person, our learned experiences like this, our behavior that we actually engage in, and the external social context that we're in. If we're in a really supportive environment, you know, we may take more risks than we would if we're not. So to recap our personality theories, Freud's theory of personality encompasses the id, the ego, the superego. They're fully formed according to Freud by the time we're about seven years old. And you can use certain therapies like hypnosis and free association and projective testing to uncover unconscious anxieties. Humanists believe there's a universal desire to self-actualize and therapy can be used to help individuals gain congruence. And then we have our social cognitive theories that highlight the variabilities of personality and trait theories that say there's no variability in personality. Now, I don't have time to go over some of these multiple choice questions. I'm going to li list them up here and you can take a look at this example of projection with Jerry. And then we have Georgie, who thinks they're very capable, which you can see if you're capable, you're feeling a sense of efficacy. Okay, I am running out of time as we get to disorders and treatment, but I do wanna at least show you some of the personality disorders and kind of trigger that memory in you to remind you that personality disorders are not often um, diagnosed until a person's had them for a while, which means you'd have to be past adolescence. They're long-term patterns of thinking and behavior. And while we do not go through with cluster A, I do want to mention and at least look at B and C disorders, B being those dramatic emotional people and C being the anxious and fearful people. Cluster B disorders include all the ones I have listed here. Like I said, they are uh, characterized by very dramatic behaviors, erratic, meaning you're, you're not consistent in your behavior. The two people get confused mostly are borderline and dependent and uh, well, at least borderline personality disorder, people forget that these are people who make frantic attempts to avoid abandonment. So when you see people who engage in suicidal behaviors, you might see a borderline personality disorder. But these disorders can also include antisocial personality, those that take advantage of others, who victimize others with no remorse by breaking rules. Cluster C disorders are the, and I had this incorrect on the last slide, I apologize. This, this is where we see the dependent personality disorder. This is where we find people who probably grew up with authoritarian parents who don't know how to make their own decisions and they're fearful of, of, of pushing other people away or disappointing them. And then you have avoidant personality people who are constantly feeling like they're being judged. So these two different clusters of personality disorders um, could be seen in different case studies. So go ahead and pause here and read through this case study. And then go ahead and read through Herbert's case study and see if you can't try to determine which of these are different case studies. This is antisocial. And as you can see in the previous one with Sam, it seems like a narcissistic personality disorder. Okay, where they're very much thinking that they are uh, deserving of more than others. Okay. There are different cognitive therapies associated to treating different psychological disorders, including personality disorders. Um, we have rational emotive behavioral therapy, which really confronts people's beliefs about, about you know, who they are, what they should do, what they must do that lead to irrational beliefs. And people who are depressed often believe that they're not fulfilling certain obligations. They have these kind of irrational thought processes or belief systems. Then you have cognitive behavioral therapies, which really try to underline, like, un like restructure somebody's schemas. You know, how you interpret we know, how you interpret a stimulus will definitely change how you feel about it. And cognitive behavioral therapies kind of try to restructure the way you think about something so you don't feel so negative about it. Okay, these two therapies can be used to treat some of these psychological disorders. But the one that's used to treat some of the personality disorders that are particularly destructive, like borderline, is dialectical behavioral therapy. And Marsha Linehan um, developed this therapy, and it was really based on mindfulness practices, tolerating distress, like being okay with not being okay. 
right? And regulating how one responds emotionally to things. So all three of these types of therapies are used to treat different psychological disorders. And like I said, I highlighted DBT primarily because it's used to treat borderline personality disorder and suicidal behavior. So again, there are three types of or clusters of personality disorders. We went through a few of B and C. Cluster B disorders are really emotional, erratic behaviors, dramatic behaviors. Cluster C disorders are typically anxious and fearful behaviors. And again, there are different treatment methods that can be used. A lot of cognitive therapies can be used to treat this, these disorders because so many of them are because of irrational thought processes. Okay, at the end of every session, as you can see, we always present uh, an FRQ. This is the last of the FRQs I'll be presenting for you for session seven. So if you have a chance before you uh, meet with Dr. Swope in the next session where he will review this FRQ with you, please try to write it. Um, again, we're asking you to look at the incentive theory of motivation. That's that intrinsic, extrinsic, the big five personality traits. And if you see that on an FRQ, pick one of the big five traits to use and the Schachter-Singer two-factor theory. So in emotions, so you're gonna to have to definitely use cognition, right? You're gonna to have to use that cognitive appraisal um, of the uh, physiological event. So, or I should say the physiological response. These, this is the last FRQ that we're giving you. And I hope you've had a chance to go onto the AP Classroom uh, website and look at the other practice FRQs that are made available to you. I've enjoyed presenting to you for these last four sessions that I was able to, and I wish you all the best luck on the exam. You know, you have this, you know everything. I need you to relax and cognitively appraise the exam as an opportunity to show what you know. So good luck with that and good luck with your future careers.